Welcome to the Archive. In today's discourse episode, Connor and I discuss a concept called the perennial philosophy, as well as psychedelics and altered states of consciousness, and how they correlate to the idea of a single unified truth, which underlies all major world religious ideologies. With that, let's jump right in. Perennial philosophy. The belief that at the core of all the great religions and wisdom traditions exists the same mystical experience of a true ultimate reality. All disagreements between systems, differing names and languages, myths, etc., are just surface level differences. All of the major world religions and traditions are supposed to have their roots connecting back to a singular, though ancient and forgotten, knowledge and tradition. The perennial philosophy has its historical roots in the syncretism of Renaissance humanists like Marsilio Ficino and Pico della Mirandola, who suggested that Plato, Jesus, Hermes Trismegistus, and the Kabbalah were all pointing to the same God, and they were almost excommunicated from the church as a result. Leibniz, as well as other philosophers, have coined the term Philosophia Perennis, which influenced the transcendentalism of Emerson, Coleridge, and Thoreau. The idea then reached a mass market through Aldous Huxley's 1945 book, The Perennial Philosophy. During the 60s, it became nearly the foundational idea of the New Age. Examples of texts discussing the perennial philosophy are Huxley's book, Helena Blavatsky's The Secret Doctrine, Rene Ganon's The Universal Language of the Sacred Science, and many, many others. You could think of it as an overarching umbrella that encapsulates all of the major world religious processes, right. dogmas, doctrines, and anything that seems to be different on the surface. Exactly. Languages, titles for certain gods, ideas of the afterlife. These are all cultural skins or colors or tastes that are meaningless. Yes. Not to say that they don't have meaning. It's just that the differences are surface level right and it's almost as though it's kind of like a an attempt to be a binding agent because whether or not there's those surface level differences the claim in part is that all of those differences were still given to those people by god right and how those differences manifested were just sort of products of humanity products of the culture of that at that time right what was relevant whether or not there's a diaspora here or these people killing these people or languages being split over time across geographical locations or whatever is happening the idea is that there is a single tradition or a single real objective truth real supreme reality that's out there that we had knowledge of at one point in history that unified all people sort of like in an atlantean paradise of sorts some utopia and over time after some event or series of events it is branched out and we've lost the true knowledge of this actual real reality and that all of the major world religions are just fragments of it that all touch upon the truth right because they're all saying very similar things and that's the idea of the perennial philosophy so now that we've sort of defined it uh uh it was popularized the idea of the it was popularized the idea of the perennial philosophy by aldous huxley Mm -hmm. in his book called the same thing the perennial philosophy Mm -hmm. and it was that book that truly took off and became public knowledge and in the 60s this boom of of individuals wanting to learn about eastern religion and culture sort of really took hold Mm. in the west even though it had been happening in occult circles for decades Mm. this is essentially when the religion of no religion began forming Mm. and a lot of people sort of went apostate from the church and there were people like Alan Watts and a bunch of other public speakers coming up out of the grassroots and talking about Eastern religion and sort of trying to syncretically bind all of the religious ideas together and now we have this idea of the perennial philosophy so we should do a book review on it we definitely will so keep your eyes out for that but now that we've defined it given some cultural history some background of where it came from we should just have fun talking about some examples uh, of the connections between the religious orders that are very similar. Because yeah. there, there's good, and then there is bad to be said about the perennial philosophy. There is a lot of criticism and critique out there that I agree with, and then there's a lot to be gained out of this idea. So we should talk about it. Yeah, and one thing that I really liked what you said is that you said it's we've lost touch with this idea of the perennial philosophy or, or 
perhaps the perennial experience. And, you know, part of my own idiosyncratic philosophy is that all religions are in some way, shape or form an attempt to revert back to the style of thinking that our pre-rational mythic ancestors operated within. So, and that's a big claim of Kabbalah as well. Kabbalah is, at least some claim that Kabbalah is an attempt to get in touch with those cognitive outputs, which were in some sense more aligned with the divine. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of overlap from a lot of uh, different cultures. So yeah. I, we will, we should dive into that deeply. Yeah. Briefly to go over the good and the bad of the perennial philosophy, just to give that little extra touch of a background so everyone knows what we're talking about. The goodness about the perennial philosophy, in my opinion, is that it really does attempt to unify all cultures. Like, truly, right. it's, it's looking at the good a noble from everything. Pursuit. It is noble. It's good intent. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's some actual merit to it. When you actually start to look at the examples, you see huge overlaps that really don't make a whole lot of sense. There are some reasons proposed by people in different circles. Rupert Sheldrake is a name we'll talk about later in this episode as to why that might be. Or maybe the truth is that we really do spawn from this one true unified religious order th that we all forgot. But that's the goodness of it all. But there is a lot of criticism. Yes. Again, one of the criticisms is it's too generalizing. Right. Well, and I could think of, you know, we, we talk about this a little bit where if we can all agree maybe that there are truths encapsulated in all religions, you still have to maintain that at some level there's a hierarchy of which religions are closer to the truth. So the perennial philosophy in some way could make someone think that the perennial philosophy in some way could make it so someone could jump to this conclusion that no they're all on equal playing playing they're all on the same playing field. So you're touching on almost two different criticisms at once. Yes. Because one of them is it's too overgeneralizing. It tries to lump too many religious orders together that don't belong. For a quick example, the the Tao mm -hmm. does not recognize the individual at all. Right. But Christianity is all about the individual and the individual experience through the Logos and uh, the, the their personal God, uh, the monotheistic right. God. But the claim is that differences like those are arbitrary in comparison to the ultimate truth that is the perennial philosophy and that's the counter argument right but right. that's why some people are like oh it's way it tries too hard to fit puzzle pieces together that don't otherwise fit and it destroys the culture and it leaves a bad impression on new minds who might be trying to interface with these new religious uh, ideas it's almost like painting them in an incorrect light mm -hmm. saying like oh this fits here but really it doesn't mm -hmm. and then the second criticism that you also touched on is that hierarchies do tend to be formed because we're just human beings and everything is hierarchical and trying to connect all of the dots from all of these differing religious ideas y there have been instances in history from people who are proponents of the perennial philosophy in which their hierarchical placement of which religious orders are closer to the truth than others has led to a denigration of very specific religious subsects such as Christianity for instance during this whole religion of no religion movement from the 60s to the 80s, mm -hmm. there was so much hype about Eastern religion, right? the Tao, about uh, Buddhism. As well as indigenous cultures and shamanism. Yep, and it's led to this sort of hatred for Christianity. And in my opinion, it's just a, an overreaction or sort of rebellion against yes. the current order, which is normal. It makes sense. We've talked a lot about it in other episodes, mm -hmm. post-modernity and other, other buzzwords that we use. But... It is one of the major criticisms is just if you believe that everything is connected into one overarching umbrella, you have to also accept the fact that it's going to become hierarchically assembled in in the person's mind. And oftentimes that leads to a skewing of the information because the in truth, the perennial philosophy is attempting to say that there is an equal level at the foundation of all of these religious ideas. It is not trying to posit that Christianity is awful and that Taoism is amazing. Or that the philosophies of Hinduism are better than the philosophies of Buddhism. Right, but that's how it is actually historically unfolded right. from the mouths of the individuals who are promulgating these ideas across mm. history. And the last reason that personally I feel that the perennial philosophy is sometimes a negative thing is that it disallows a person to be able to go deep, deep, deep into one religious 
experience, not always, but it tends to do that to people because if you develop a love for or reverence for this idea, then it will lead you down a path in which you're doing research on this religion and this religion and this religion, sort of eclectically tasting everything and building this worldview syncretically through syncretism, which is just connecting all the parts and pieces that are loosely connected. Mm. But it disallows you the respect for a single tradition such that you might actually go deeply down that rabbit hole and perform those rituals and really dive into those traditions and have those mystical or, or religious experiences yourself because you're tasting everything at such a foundation or such a surface level. Well, you're, and also doesn't matter which religion you dive into, you're going to be looking for this idea of the perennial philosophy, which could act as sort of a, a blinder or a deterrent or a deterrent yeah. so that you can't see the actual nuances of the philosophies and the rituals and, exactly. the, and yeah. the practices themselves. It almost like taints the single religious order itself. And so that is one of the major criticisms. Again, it just, it, it tries too hard to put them all together. And so if you look at it that way, exactly like that. Like, but, but if somebody is on the other hand, scouring through multiple religions, what is the argument that has been put forth by the perennialists? that is the common denominator where, where can we find that how do we define what is that which binds it all together so that's a really good question there are occult sources that you can read who ascribe more definition than others mm -hmm. for this idea and some of them don't even use the terminology because they're older than Aldous Huxley or, sure. you, you know what I mean? But right. Helena Blavatsky is one of them. She wrote a, a book that's quite famous in the occult circles called The Secret Doctrine. Mm -hmm. There's also another very famous occultist by the name of Rene Ganon who wrote some books on this as well as others, Manly P. Hall, Freemasons mm -hmm. who talk about these ideas, Rudolf Steiner. So, so many names that you could just like vomit out there for anybody to go research mm -hmm. who try to describe what this actually is in detail but there's no mainstream source like Aldous Huxley who really can tell you and if you do a Google search there's not really a solid definition but there are sources out there that you could read and study and I can leave some links in the description right. for people to go grab some books or at least download some PDFs and, and do some deep diving and thumbing through but the concept is mystical it does boil down to a, a singular sort of godhead that exists outside of the phenomenological world or this world that you can perceive by yourself there is sort of an aspect of ego dissolution and like karma with some level of personal responsibility there, there there's a lot of overarching recurring themes and motifs that they are painting to describe this image of just the matrix kind of like right. we're all existing in the matrix for reasons that some people claim to know and others don't, but ultimately the, this idea that's promulgated by many is very similar and, and it, it, all, it really boils down to just God experiencing itself subjectively. It's almost as though it's to, to embody the perennial philosophy is to interface with reality with the knowledge of what reality truly is in its pith essence. Right, yeah. It's always a conversation of duality versus non-duality mm -hmm. and contradictions and paradoxes and consciousness versus unconsciousness and awareness versus non-awareness. Um, like reincarnation or perpetually, if not you reincarnating, it's just the perpetual carrying forward of the energy itself of the universe mm -hmm. and why. It's very much like the old cliche, you know, like before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After, After enlightenment, enlightenment, chop, chop wood, wood, carry, carry water, water. Because your life doesn't necessarily change with the knowledge of the ultimate truth. Just your perception of reality changes with that ultimate truth. And then it's up to the will and the intellect to actually make a change occur. Right. So you can use knowledge to make changes, but it's not like gaining the knowledge actually will change you at all. That There are some, some schools out there who talk about that a lot. But just to answer the question of what is the perennial philosophy, there's no mainstream answer for that. And there's, there's a lot of back and forth between different occult circles. But there are books out there that you can study. There, there are phenomenal texts that will help paint the picture and make it a little bit more clear and less obscure. Right, because I can think of examples to put forth that 
are common amongst most mainstream religions, but they seem very surface level. Sure. I like, mean, for example, like the, the idea of the Trinity, right? That yeah, shows it's a up huge one. Taoism, Christianity, uh, Buddhism, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like let, let's let's break it apart a little bit. Yeah. At this point, let's just dive into it. So, for instance, everyone knows the Trinity who was raised as a Christian in the West or right. or a Catholic. You right. Know, and the, if you're not, you know, it's the it's the it's the Lord. The God, God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, or Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. so it's the Trinity, right? God, Father, Holy Spirit, and then, uh, sorry, God, God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes, that's what I'm trying to say. And then Jeez. in Hinduism, it's Shivu, Shiva, Vishnu, and, and Brahma. Brahma. So let's just go ahead and jump into some examples and just have fun in this conversation talking about all of the similarities. Yeah. Well, I spent a lot of time in the last few days thinking about this and thinking about potential examples of ideas or concepts or philosophies that do show up across multiple religions, I can't help but feel that they seem surface level compared to a true mystical experience. But I guess if we're just talking in the realm of ideas, I would say one of the biggest ones would be the idea of the Trinity, right? Absolutely. Shows up everywhere. Yeah. Eastern, Western, doesn't matter where you look. Yeah, let's just give a couple, like, break, let's break them down. Yeah, let's do the easiest one first, which is Christianity, which is uh, God... The, the Son and the and Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Yep, Father, yep. Son, Holy Spirit. Yep. Exactly. So that's the main Protestant and Catholic Christian trinity. Then you've got uh, a trinity in Hinduism, which is Brahma, mm -hmm. Vishnu, and Shiva. Brahma is sort of like the creator god. Yep. The, the, or, the, they're not even, like, they are separate gods, but they're aspects of one singular godhead. They're aspects of one sort of giant process. And Brahma is the creator Vishnu is the preserver who sort of is like the glue of all of reality. So Brahma spits it all out. Vishnu sort of holds it all together right. once it's out there, gives it its own agency and form. And then Shiva is the destroying agent, which cleaves and destroys to make way for new things to be created. Yeah. And so the Trinity sort of holds it all together in, a, in like a triangular fashion. Yeah, and the fun little real world example of that is... You know, the, you know, you've heard the old cliche that your body regenerates itself every seven years um, because the cells destroy themselves and then regenerate new versions of themselves. And that's kind of like that mm -hmm. Hindu idea that yeah. there's that which is created, that which is destroyed, and that which binds together that creates the whole creation process. and destruction. Yep. It's like if you see a tree and you chop it down and then you build a bed frame, it's like you, you, there was creation to the tree, you destroyed the tree. And but it still has an agency. There's still wood, although the tree has been destroyed. There's still like woody woodness, and then you take that woody woodness and then you recreate something new out of it <clears throat> in this sort of like alchemical process. And that all, all three of those godheads are active during that whole process, like right. constantly. And the next big one is uh, in you know the famous line in in the Tao Te Ching, which is one gives birth to two, two gives birth to three, and three gives birth to all things. To all things, and that's another huge uh symbol that also occurs in judaic mysticism mm -hmm. through kabbalah which the tripart god before manifestation before any of reality comes into being you've got ayin which is the great unmanifest it's yeah. literally anti-existence it's just <clears throat> pure potentiality right and you can think of it as like a nothingness that is so full of void and nothing that it actually contains the potential for all possibility right and then from ein through some mystical process ein sof is then emergent which ein sof means basically the potential like the thing in and of itself it's it's literally like the first aspect of god that sort of comes into fruition from this void and then in and then right after that you've got ein sof or which is the limitless light that shines from Ein Sof, and that light is what sort of breaks down into the tree of life, ultimately creating this world around us and all of the worlds that are possible. So it's this th three-part godhead of complete void, something that, that comes from nothing, and of that something, everything else that occurs. So it's the it's the one becomes two, becomes three, and then from three, all things. You can think of the tree of life, which is at the bottom of that three-part godhead, as the number four, and five and six and seven, all the way until infinity. Exactly. That's, well, that's another, another one. thing. You're, that's another commonality that you're putting forth, not to deviate away from the Trinity idea, because that's interesting in itself, but the idea that before the creation of God, there was this kind of substance that wasn't really a substance it was more like nothingness that came into being which is very Taoist, which is the Tao. yeah and there's also a huge aspect of that in 
uh, Mahayana Buddhism. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a couple different branches of Buddhism, but in Mahayana Buddhism, there's a three part aspect of God, which is the Dharmakaya, which means the the void or the unmanifest. Mm -hmm. There's the Sambhogakaya, which is basically like beingness. Like it's just it's sort of that same idea. And then from there, you've got the Nirmanakaya, which is body or like physical reality. So it's it's again even in Buddhism this void from void comes something and from a somethingness comes like all manifested things in this weird trinity. Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans uh, in their occult school represented the world as math and geometry. So the fundamental geometrical figure in a two-dimensional plane is the triangle. Right. And Pythagoras had this system of sacred number from zero to 10, which sort of describes a process which is very similar to everything that we've already talked about so far, where zero and one become two, which become three, and then leads into everything. And that the triangle is representative of that from the three sides and the three points being the most fundamental shape that gives rise to all other shapes. Right, it's the, it's the most basic form that matter can propagate on. And that's kind of interesting too, because the Hebrew Bible actually, one of the names for God is Tetragrammaton. Yeah, but that means four, mm -hmm. which which is another huge aspect of the three right, becoming that, the four. That's exactly what I'm right. saying. That's yep. what I'm highlighting. And yep. then it's like the number four represents all of what is potentially possible in reality. Right. There's so many examples of this as well, even in the tarot. But the tarot comes from directly Kabbalah. There's a lot of argument about that. But so many examples of the Trinity that just exists everywhere. And so you think to yourself, okay, well... And even in like the Celtic tradition and some of the Nordic stuff, they're, they're, the the knot when when they get married, they tie a knot three three ways. There's mm -hmm. like a three tied knot. There's a whole aspect of Trinity happening there as well. Yeah, well, there's also the uh, a more biological Trinity, which is the the idea of you know mother f and father and and child. And then the child, yeah. And so that's that's an archetype that exists across all of the major world religious orders and traditions of seeing the world as this masculine energy and this feminine energy and then it comes together and then it creates this whole new this whole new creation in the middle of it all this transcendent emergence is like when a line segment becomes a triangle and it's just amazing to me that all of these geographically separated, historically separated, culturally separated groups all c came to very similar conclusions. And that's what the perennial philosophy is trying to say, is that it's trying to give an, an answer, which is very simplistic, for how it's possible that all of these people from all these cultures and such remote locations that are completely removed from each other, all sort of emerged into having the same or very similar seeming religious ideas. Right. There have been some arguments some newer arguments about why it's possible. Earlier you mentioned Rupert Sheldrake. Rupert Sheldrake is a pseudoscientist, or called that by many. He has an idea of the morphic resonance. Right, which is like the idea that if you train a bunch of rats how to do a certain maze in England, and then you have that same species of rats do it a year later in Seattle, it'll somehow, they'll be better at doing it because the idea is somehow in the air in the metaphysical space. Exactly. So it's like it exi it exists out there, it was created, now it's floating around. So other intellects or agents in this weird matrix system that we live in called reality now have a higher potential uh, and probability of interfacing yeah. with those ideas. Right. So that's sort of like morphic resonance. There, there's a, there's a joke in the in the community of people who are authors and writers where if you come up with an idea, you better write it quickly. Because <laughs> you're putting it out there and someone else is going to pick Some, up on it. Someone will pick up on yeah. that frequency now because yep. it's like out in the world. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there, there's some kind of far-fetched sort of pseudoscientific woo-woo new age ideas like that, which you may or may not buy into. Um, and then there, again, are the more traditionalist sort of perennialist ideas, such as literally there was one unified tradition in the very, very, very far past that right. we all forgot about. And everything That's in between. That's very union too. the idea that once there was a time when all of mankind was... Um, assimilated around this idea that they were all children of God or children of the sun. Right, and then it, then uh, like uh, Akhenaten, right? Or Akhenaten. Yeah. Akhenaten, Akhenaten, don't kill me. I know what you're trying to say. The, the Egyptian pharaoh, yeah. uh, Akhenaten. Akhenaten, goodness. But everywhere in between those two poles of argumentation lie reasoning for the perennial philosophy. Like, why could this have happened? how can this be? It's insane. And, and nobody really knows for sure. 
We just know that the perennial philosophy is a is an idea now, and we're having a discussion about it. Right. Well, like Terence McKenna had this idea, right? And I think that it's kind of in line with the perennial philosophy, but he called it the archaic revival, which is, I think in Terence's mind, was more of an attempt to revert back to the culture of our ancient, primitive, mythic, pre-rational ancestors, whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. I think you could take that a step further and say that instead of just trying to revert back to the style of living and the culture that you could actually revert back to the mode of thinking. Obviously, we can never fully go back to that place, right? We've opened a can of worms that can't be opened with empiricism, but we can at least do our best to try to get in touch with those things. And I feel like maybe that's what the perennial philosophy is postulating, that through religion or through the ultimate truth that underlies all religion, we can somehow revert back. Right, if there is an absolute truth. Right. So again, that's some of the argument. And we really only put forth one example, which is the yeah, idea of the, the Trinity. Trinity. But, but there's, there's so other many. there's so many examples of religious overlap. It would be impossible to really go over them all. Mm -hmm. But there's also so many examples of differences in those religious orders as well, like that's com true. complete difference. So it's it, it is hard. But uh, I, I like that you reference McKenna's archaic revival. We have the book right here mm -hmm. in in the in the uh, in the archive studio space, but. Yeah, there's a great book as well um, called The Archetypal Cosmos mm -hmm. in which the author is trying to argue that we should revisit those old paradigmal worldviews, yeah. but not just like romantically go back in the past yes. and relive them, but we should integrate them with our scientific worldview moving forward. So whereas we've sort of shed our mythological approach to looking at the world, you know, we, we no longer think like striking thunder and lightning over there is Thor literally striking his hammer on an anvil. That's not our literal understanding when we see lightning anymore. We have this idea of electron flow and grounding and atmospheric conditions and pressure and all this stuff. Right. And Whereas like, you know, like there once was a time, especially in the Judaic people, is that they believed that anytime something bad happened externally, that it was the, the, the root cause was something that they had done or, or something that they had thought. And they understood that through allegory and stories right. and myths, and they sort of represented truths about being a human being or actual occurrences in the world through the human lens, you know, using humanity as the oracle in which you're actually understanding the world around you, mm. sort of like projecting humankind onto the world. And that has shifted in the modern era. Right. But that text, The Archetypal Cosmos, is all about going back to that old paradigm of creating stories and myths and representations and sort of projecting humanity onto things, but then amalgamating it and conjoining it with our new understanding of the actual, quote unquote, reality of what's occurring in space. So not to conflate them or confuse them, but there is value in talking about those old paradigmal stories and using storytelling and finding the morals and motifs in those stories to promulgate and push forward new narratives yeah. which are conjoined again, again with our real understanding of things yeah and i don't know if this is a a misconception or, or maybe a bad analogy but there's an alchemical idea that if you find yourself in a place in your life that's unmanageable one strategy that you can indulge is that you can consciously make an effort to Go back to something you once believed that you don't believe anymore and see if it fits your framework better. Mm. And so, and, and to me, that's a lot like the idea of integrating rather than re mm -hmm. repression. So if we can maybe use our imagination a little bit and say, well, like all of human history is kind of like one individual's life. Yep. It's best for us to look back to what we once were in order to figure out how we move forward Oh, yeah. Future. Yeah, absolutely. To digress just a bit there, I, I always feel salty about the way mainstream academia does its thing, how people are taught in school in the Western tradition is that because of hyper competitive markets and everything's based on money and mm. profit margins and increasing profits and all of this weird Western greed sickness stuff, mm. we go to school and specialize in our fields and in our crafts not necessarily to gain insight onto what it means to be better people. We're not learning about critical thought. We're not learning about the liberal arts, as they used to be called. Mm -hmm. The liberal arts are tools that we use in order to free ourselves and become free men and women, free citizens who can contribute to the whole right. properly. 
Instead, we're so hyper-focused on technical crafts and craft right. work that we lose complete sight of that entire picture of what it means to be a holistic individual. Mm -hmm. And so when you're becoming a scientist or a mathematician or a, a, pharm a pharmacist or whatever it is that you're doing in your field, especially if it's scientific, because of that hyper-competitive marketplace, you go to school to learn the newest and the shiniest and the most recent and the most effective and most efficient theory that works now in order for you to push the paradigm and push the envelope forward and to continue the, comp the competition, to continue create nuance that is marketable, that you can sell, rather than the majority of those scientists actually understanding the history of where their science comes from. I know that there are studies out there, there are majors, there are people who go to school and then learn these things, but in general, the way that our social order works, people aren't worried about the ancients and the way that they used to think. People aren't worried about how science was thought of in the medieval era. Right. Like, no one is studying Isaac Newton's text. No one's really reading anything about optics. It's like Unless you happen to pick philosophy as your major, right, it's because a niche we, market. We have point. it all figured out in, in a way that's useful and pragmatic. So because of the hyper-competitive market, we just continue down that path. For, in general, like the, the consensus does that. Right. So because of that, we're not necessarily focused on how we got to where we are or revisiting those old ideas or trying to integrate those old ideas into our new paradigm of thought. And I think it leads to a bit of neurosis. And it's like this separation where I'm really all about integrating the old into the new, just like you right. are. Imagine if you didn't know what happened in your own life from age 20 to 30 you'd be an incomplete individual. Right. So if you if you project that onto like I said human history as a whole, there's a there's a blind spot. There's mm -hmm. something about ourselves that we don't know and the troubling part that you're highlighting is not that we don't know but we want to know, it's that we don't care because it doesn't manifest into capital. Right. Well, it doesn't see exactly that. It doesn't seem useful to us because our value systems and structures have been all jankified. Right. To use a neologism, jankified. I love jankified. that term. I love it. But that 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 is what's happened that that does happen though biologically like you don't remember your childhood that's true but as an adult not knowing your childhood seemingly is not that important because you go to work you get a job you have kids you you provide for them and you try to raise them properly and you try to do your life properly but knowing how you operated as a child when you were dependent upon other human beings doesn't seem to jive in our minds at first with being a sovereign individual it's like, okay, then I was dependent, and now I'm not. So how at all does how I behaved and thought about the world when I was dependent translate to me as a human being now being independent and doing my own thing? Like, I'm an adult now. Right. I, like, th there's, there's this weird dichotomy of thought where people are always like, oh, I'm an adult. I can do what I want to. I'm an adult. I don't have to answer to any of my actions or whatever. It's translating from this sort of ignorance to our past in right. this way. And this this might be like an overgeneralization, but just bear with me just for half a sec. And we've learned through psychoanalysis and a ton of experimentation and a ton of interviewing and helping people sitting on couches and talking to their psychotherapists that learning about our history as children is so, so important, especially because now we know how the brain works and how our formative years process and all of these things. So right. now... It's different now. Right. It's like, oh, we should pay attention to that thing. Yeah. We should integrate those experiences that we had as children into our adulthood. But that's not necessarily readily apparent to us, I think, like on the surface level. Right. And it translates to exactly what's happening in academia with the science. Stuff. Well, yeah, it's like because like you just said, there is an overwhelming and incontrovertible amount of data that indicates that simply writing about your past will make you less anxious and less depressed as a person. So there's a lot of. There's a lot of overlapping archetypal evidence of looking back is good for moving forward, for sure. Right. Well, that's why we remember the past. You know, we, nature always takes the path of least resistance. We don't have the capacity for things that aren't pragmatic, so there is that. We don't have the capacity for things that aren't pragmatic, and therefore we must assume that us being able to remember the past, especially very far into the past, which I, which I guess we all just assume that animals can't think back 20 years <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but just the ability to do that means that it has efficacy in helping us move forward or it's some utility some utility but yeah so my i mean to use that line of reasoning though maybe there isn't as much biological or evolutionary utility as we think in looking back because if we can't actually physically remember it 
our childhood, then maybe there's not a need to biologically or evolutionarily, right? But Or maybe just that not being in control and having someone else dictate your entire life is traumatizing to the point where your brain <laughs> shuts it down. Maybe. That could be part of it. Yeah. Or it could just be that there's so much going on in the brain during those formative years that we're so complicated. It's sort of... It, there is not a processing unit there, right? I'm pretty sure that's more the case. There isn't literally a unit that is capable of processing and storing those memories mm -hmm. until you reach a certain point and then it exists and then it starts producing those memories and you start recalling things and, right. and everything. It's just, it, it's a product of the emergence of like the more simple brain becoming more and more complexified. Right, but the, and, uh, and, complex. and to bring it full circle, the point is, is that it's not obvious why writing about your life or learning about your history would make your life better which right. is why we're not interested in learning about the past anymore because it doesn't really make sense as to why it would be beneficial it doesn't seem it, it doesn't seem as valuable as focusing on the here and the right now it's like up in the clouds thoughts like what am i going to actually get out of this how is this going to help me eat tomorrow and we just don't think about it a lot but um although now now in this golden era of human history where we've escaped the food chain and mm -hmm. you know really figured out the game of food and and mastered it we have more time and energy to do that than ever. Yeah. But yet we are less introspective than ever, I'd, I would wait. For sure, yeah. I mean, Mortimer Adler, I always mention Adler, he wrote some essays on how to properly use our, your leisure time. And it's just mm. unfortunate that we don't use our leisure for self-study and improvement. Instead, we're just circus and breading it up. Call of Duty, man. Yeah. It's always been circus and bread, man. Always, since yeah. the days of the Romans, since... And whether or not that's, you know, an instantiated mechanism in society to distract us or just that we have so many other or so many or just that we have so many options of ways to distract ourselves that it's just we it's oversaturated at this point. Yeah. It's, it, when you have things out there like World of Warcraft that are so are, that are we're literally built to be addicting <laughs> yeah. and stimulating yeah how am i supposed to compete with that and convince someone no you should go read about nietzsche and, or, and the or the perennial philosophy or the perennial philosophy it doesn't there's no competition yeah. there yeah it's hard it's super tough but i mean that's why our channel exists right that's why people like us in the world are trying to trying to do good things right so moving on from that quick digression there we were talking about the perennial philosophy and you had mentioned the religious experience a few times mm -hmm. Recently, we've done a book review, two book reviews on DMT and Rick Strassman's DMT, The Spirit Molecule. Mm -hmm. And the DMT, The Soul of Prophecy. Yep. And talking about psychedelics and how the altered state of consciousness that one can interface with, whether or not you are under the influence of drugs, alcohol, having a near-death experience, or just like walking down the street and getting struck by an epiphany and or, having a religious experience. Yeah, or deep meditation. Deep meditation, near to, uh, sleeping, dreaming states. Anytime that your normal state of consciousness is altered, having these wild experiences relate to the perennial philosophy because it seems from all of those occultists that I had mentioned previously in the episode that they're always talking about your personal experience as an individual mm. and reaching out and interfacing with these real objective realities or these real truths, these true truths that underlie all of reality. You as an individual through a process called gnosis are reaching out and touching that thing through your own direct experience. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about psychedelics today to sort of couple with those episodes we did of the book reviews. So, I mean, I know that you've got some strong opinions. Both of us really enjoy Terrence McKenna and Alan Watts and other people who talk about LSD and DMT and all these mm -hmm. cool drugs. Not to actually just put a disclaimer out there. We're not telling anyone to go do drugs right now. We're not actually saying drugs are good. This is just educational and we're just having a fun discussion. So putting that out there for all of the platforms. Please don't deplatform us for talking about drugs. But yeah, the psychedelic experience is pretty crazy, and it does relate to the perennial philosophy because it seems like the experiences that one has tends to always, in some shape or form, lead you down that rabbit hole, which when you open a religious text and you get deep enough into the actual secrets inside of that text and the esoteric knowledge mm -hmm. deep inside of that text, there is a lot of overlap. And it leads me to sometimes ask the question, you know, where, where are the connections lying? How can this even be altered states of consciousness leading to these epiphanies? 
which then lead to writing these sacred texts, which then lead to people creating religious orders and then people forgetting all about the actual experience. It's just kind of a conundrum, isn't right. it? It's kind of a funny cycle. It's a funny cyclic process. Well, I want to put this out there. Scientists really need to figure out whether or not bursts of endogenous chemicals that produce psychedelic visions happen in the average individual. Like, that just needs to be uncovered. Because well, it's been postulated for so long. It's that, is, talk- that it's possible? That it's possible. Mm-hmm. I mean, we know mm-hmm. that DMT exists in rats, so we can pretty much safely assume that it exists in us because our physiology is, is comparative. But the question beyond that is, can certain life events randomly or, or, or ca- in a calculated way trigger these endogenous bursts? I mean, that's a really, really good question that I agree with you. Science needs to figure out. Yeah. <laughs> like, like a real consensus about it, because right now there isn't one. Right. And it's, it's just crazy, though, because when you really, I don't know if you have had any crazy religious type experiences. I know you said that you've meditated before and you've had some really, really profound meditative experiences. Mm-hmm. I've had a lot of crazy cool experiences in my life and visionary episodes and, and things which have led me to literally behold what I have read in things like a Kabbalistic text such as Sefer Yetzirah or the Hebrew Bible, for instance, to yeah. shout out Rick Strassman. Do you know who Saad Guru is? You ever watch that guy on YouTube? Mm, no. He's um he's a Hindi, a Hindu. Oh, I might have actually. And he's very denigrative against psychedelics. Hmm. Um, there's actually a interview where he's talking to a scientist, and the scientist was saying, oh, I've had a similar experience on psychedelics, and Saad Guru was so staunch, like, no, that's not what it was, <laughs> even though he's never taken them. He's that's like, funny. He's, well, but there is utility in that, at least to my perspective, because when I've meditated, mm-hmm. the experience is very Eastern, it's very void-like, it's, it's yeah. very much like I'm interfacing with nothingness, if, mm-hmm. if nothingness is somethingness exactly. in some way. Exactly. Whereas like my psychedelic <laughs> experience are more like Rick Strassman's idea of prophecy mm-hmm. or the Hebrew Bible's idea of prophecy where it's it's very visual, it's very vibrant, it's very colorful, mm-hmm. it's very interactive as though right. like I'm not the only recipient in the exchange. Right, like you're not the only single identity or single consciousness. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's lower level. So I like that you bring that up. So the um, Buddhists, uh, who, not the Mahayanas, but the... Um, Tibetans, sorry, mm. the, the the Tibetans, they have said at times, I think it was even Terrence McKenna who had, had mentioned this, if not, it was Jeremy Narby or some other psychedelic person in the mm-hmm. world, some psychonaut who's famous. Maybe it was even Andrew Gallimore. I really don't remember, but I remember reading uh, about how they went to give DMT to some of these monks and they took the DMT and end DMT specifically. Right. And they said that, oh, yep, those are the lesser lights. Like, yeah. This take this substance right here takes you to the lesser lights, and you can go no further than this and come back alive. Basically, is what they said. And you also can go no further than this on the substance, and the, the true true, which is beyond the lesser lights, which are like the greater realities, uh, exists in forms which that NNDMT can't take. Now, them. when they say because le- I've heard this story before, and I've always wondered this, when they say lesser lights, I, I believe it was a Terrence McKenna lecture where he Could've highlighted been. that. Yeah. Are, 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 is that like um, is that uh, is that a, like a judgment on those beings that no, they're bad or no, malevolent in n- some way? No, it's a good question. No, it's not about good or badness. It literally means hierarchically lesser. So, the anything that has form in a lot of these philosophies and religious orders and the perennial philosophy, anything that actually is existing that has a form that has a thought that that you can interface with as like a thinking living individual implies a separation right right because you are a thing and that is a thing that is not you and through some process you are able to mentally observe it and think about it and interact with it so it implies a separation right i kind of thought the same thing but i thought maybe it's kind of like you know there's god and then there's the angels who are like the emanations of god doing Mm -hmm. god's work Mm -hmm. but then there's also us underneath that yep who are in some sense also emanations of God doing God's work, but at a mm-hmm. lower level. Mm-hmm. So I, I was, I was kind of, yeah, in it's my exactly, own mind, it's sort of very, li- very much like that. Yeah. It's hierarchical. So to go back to the Kabbalistic understanding, it's the infinite void and then somethingness, which then creates a light, and then that that light is so so vibrant that like no one can know it. You, it's like look, you can't look at the sun; it's too bright. But then as it 
crashes down into reality and becomes more and more opaque and more and more substantial rather than being like metaphysical or ethereal and it's it's more and more and more constricted the light in this metaphor it eventually lands down at the very bottom of the tree of life into what's called the kingdom or Malkut in Hebrew. And that's what we have is this world around us. Right, which is one of the reasons why the sun is often personified as God. Because you can't actually look at it. It's right. too vibrant. It's it's beyond your comprehension. Right. <clears throat> it's beyond your direct comprehension. And it's unreachable. Right, exactly. And so the, the idea of the lesser lights is just... It just means it's still something that's propagating in manifestation. It's it's like a phenomenal experience that you're having, which implies separation. And there's something beyond that, which is this somethingness. And that somethingness is truly one. It's truly a total singularity, a total unity. There is no separation in truth. So from the from this weird world of craziness, you've got all this crazy stuff happening, then you've got this light, this beautiful, beautiful Einsoff hour, or this light, light, and then, and then one thing, so there's no more duality, it's just the oneness, and then even above the oneness is an infinite void, and in that void, you, no one can ever know it, because if there were any individual there, if there even was a oneness inside of the void or of the void, it, it already is no longer nothingness, right? It's, right. it's, it's contained. It, it, it doesn't make any logical linear sense. And that's sort of like how this idea of the Trinity or the triangle manifested of a three part system needing each other in order to maintain a balance such that anything can exist at all. Right. But that's the idea of the lesser lights. It's basically one of the legs of the three and it's the lowest one. It's, it is the only one that you could ever interface with as an individual. Right. Because, again, as an individual, separation, the light allows you to be separated from the oneness. There's, there, it's like the thing that cuts you off from it. Mm -hmm. But then if you, if you are absorbed into the oneness, then you can't look at yourself. The oneness is not aware of the oneness actually being one. There is no awareness there. It's complete mindlessness. There is no mind. And that's why Zen is called no mind. Because when you're in no mind, you are absorbed into this totality of existence. You just sort of dissolve back into the floor of reality and you become the one thing. You become the grid. You become the floor or the foundation of the matrix. And But even the Buddhists who attempted to reach that state, it seemed as though they knew that they, it was impossible to actually attain it in this incarnation in life. It's impossible to... It's like to, an ideal, right? It's right. like, you know, Christians always say we want to try to be like Christ-like mm -hmm. even though we, never, we know we could never be Christ. So there's some there's some debate as to whether or not you can actually achieve that state, but when you do achieve that state, where your cognition is, where your mentality is, can never be understood here. Right. Like you can never bring it back. It's like when yeah, well that's one of the things that people often report under the influence of psychedelics is that when they were there in that space, they knew everything. They knew everything. They had all the knowledge that there ever was, but when they came back, the knowledge didn't translate into this existence to at least in, in such a way that they could convey it to others. Exactly. And so that's a huge point of contention and criticism for people who do drugs because the scientifically minded, positivist, rational thinker will be like, how can you tell me you had all the knowledge of every single thing? But then when I ask you to tell me one thing, you can't tell me anything. It just sounds like psychobabble to me and you're crazy and you don't really know what you're talking about. And you were just in a state of psychosis and it doesn't really actually exist. And you're crazy. Um, but really, it has to do with very philosophical concepts of epistemology or mm. the study of knowledge and how we can come to know things. And, and it, again, it boils down into this separation aspect and this like, as long as you, if you have the capability of understanding a thing, that means and implies separation. Right. Because in order to understand your, it, even the word itself, understand, implies some sort of form or like spatial thing in which you, a body or being, are underneath it's, or over some other thing. Right. It's like, it's, it's a, a good analogy that I would put forth in that respect would be the idea of your thoughts. Mm -hmm. You don't really embody your thoughts because you have the capacity to, to reflect on them. You can think about your thoughts, and therefore, in some strange way, they're separate from you. Yep. And the fact that you and I are having a conversation already, of course, there's separateness. You are not the chair. The chair is not you. You're not your shadow. You're, you are you, and your shadow well, is your shadow. Well, I sometimes wonder if the, if the separateness is just 
is just a false perception and that re all of reality is really just a process that's unfolding. And it's, it is, it is, and so that is and by the naming, perennial philosophy. Like Kierkegaard said, but when you name me, you negate me. By naming me, you negate all the other things that I could possibly be. Yeah. It, you know, that is the, so earlier in the episode, you asked what is the perennial philosophy? And I said, some of the occultists have attempted to point at it and mm -hmm. talk about it. That is it. It's the concept of this one singular process that's occurring in truth that we are all a part of and, and a, like, a node inside of we're a whole on exactly yeah and we are unaware of it or whether we are aware of it doesn't really matter it just we're all a part of this oneness that is separate and this sort of dual universe that we live in is just a product of that process which is in truth one and then outside of that oneness is an infinite void of infinite potentiality that we can never know and that is what we call god and that is what we're always trying to i guess eject from the matrix and return to um, that's a lot of the major world religions that talk about, you know, becoming saved and going to heaven or escaping reincarnation and By going back Nirvana, to the Godhead. Yeah, yeah th there's a bunch of different ways to talk about it, but ultimately the perennial philosophy, to bring it back to the beginning of this episode, is attempting to highlight exactly that entire thing that you're getting at right, right. Now. It's very much Ken Wilber's idea of a whole on. I, I briefly mentioned it just a moment ago, but for anyone who doesn't know, a whole on is basically just a part and a whole. So like, you you know, like the cells in your body, mm -hmm. they're a part of your body, but they're also it, their own thing they're, in their own right. Right. They're a whole entire agents. They have their own agency. They have their own form, which separate them from the rest of reality. And this is a process in, of emergence and uh, uh, complexity theory and so many other things in which like simple things from the floor of reality are growing and evolving, becoming more and more nuanced towards the ceiling of reality, which some people would call God or whatever. But then in a weird paradoxical way, the ceiling is also the floor because everything came from that God that we're all trying to get back to. So it's this weird cyclical process Again, a unity, a, yeah. it's a circle. As, as a Kabbalist um, might say, God is everything, but not everything is God. Which is implies a directionality exactly. of like the floor up. But but then when you get to the end of that rope, when you when you dive even deeper into the occult texts and even deeper into these philosophies, you recognize that you start to learn that the floor is the ceiling, the ceiling is the floor. And although all things are God, all things are of God, but not all things are God. In some weird way, all things are God as well in a weird paradoxical fashion that we can never wrap our heads around. And that's why even in Zen Buddhism, there are these things called koans or weird statements that are paradoxical that you just you wrestle with and, so hard. Yeah. And that's something that we haven't really had a chance to talk about. And I'd love to do a discourse with you about this. But but a huge tenet of the archives philosophy and our own individual philosophies is this idea and an idea that we've experienced directly by having conversations like these is that when you get, you know, you can start from the ground up and you can have an idea and then you can talk to somebody about this idea and build up to the top. But at the at the tip of that iceberg in lies a contradiction that can't be reconciled with language itself. It's right. something that you have to have direct experience to understand. Yeah. Or I'd say it's at the floor of it. Or, yeah. That, that's well, what, but the floor, but the floor is, the is the ceiling, and the and, ceiling is the floor. And it depends on how you, how look, you look at, at it. it right. Exactly. And that's why everything's like shifting perspectives. Which is it in itself an example of that contradiction. And an example of the perennial philosophy, which, right. again, just continually po posits and puts forward that this whole unity process requires another, and it requires you as an individual. And it's like this forever thing that can never go away that we are all taking part of through this crazy thing that we call life and reality. And so, so much of this is embedded in so many different religious orders, just being called different things that that's why we wanted well, to do the episode. And I hadn't thought about that too, but you know, the, we talked a little bit earlier about the etymology of the word perennial meaning year after year. So it is in some sense, that is a process that's always mm -hmm. unfolding. Always. It's like forever. It means like from the beginning of time to the end of time, mm -hmm. which is cyclical as well, or it is thought to be at least. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot to be said here, and it's very interesting stuff when you start to get into complexity theory and talk about mm. holons and the hierarchy of holons that Wilbur does and how even is it, and it's a very mystical mystery how things that are simple stack up to become things that are more complex such that the thing that is more complex that's built out of the more simple parts is more than just the parts. Like... If, yes, it, it, that doesn't make any sense, and we don't we don't have an answer for why that 
is, but that but is. But it's obvious that the universe is unfolding that in such a yeah, way. It's I spiritual mean, evolution. E e even if we're just approaching it from the scientific framework, you know, there's the, there's a big bang or there's a singular point which expands. The singularity, and even there you go. And, even and, in the perennial philosophy, plus science, exactly. it's like science talks about a singularity existing in the beginning of all creation, of all of manifestation. We wouldn't call it creation if you were a scientist, but. All, of all phenomenological shit happening around you, it started from a singularity, exactly. right? Exactly. Which literally is the one thing, if you want to use these weird mystical terms, it's just the one thing that exists out there that we're all a part of. And then it blows up and then expands into all the shit that it happens to be separated from. And then complexifies us. over time as it forms things that you know require more quantification in order to understand them. And then eventually it becomes life, and then life becomes conscious, and we don't we really still can't even explain what consciousness mm -hmm. is or what its function is. Yeah. functionality would and be for a biological creature like ourselves. Then eventually there's theories about the big crunch that it all like either the big crunch or the big freeze or like whatever it is that your hypothesis is eventually it'll all go back to void. Everything will eventually return to a nothing state where all things are separated so much that and they just lose all agency. And the Kabbalists talk about that as well that we've somehow separated from God but that they make the claim that there will come a time where we reunite with God. Mm -hmm. which is which is kind of like this idea of, of like going back to the or void going or, back to the void yeah. yeah and all of these different major world religious orders or if you just take a couple tokes of 5 meo dmt and you go straight to the void and you come back and you say okay i literally had an ego death just now like mm -hmm. i died but now i'm alive again it's this weird thing which again goes back to some some christian-esque stuff of like being resurrected after being mm -hmm. baptized or whatever there there are many resurrection rituals across all of the traditions, especially one that comes immediately to mind is Freemasonry. There's mm. an aspect of like dying and being reborn, but very much a very Protestant or Catholic thing. Yeah. There are also a lot of coming of age ceremonies in indigenous cultures are very much predicated on the idea of death and rebirth as well. Mm, or literally like karma and the Dharma and your path on it and life and rebirth cycles through those cultures who believe in reincarnation, literally mm. transmigration of souls and such. There's so much that's interconnected here, and it all boils down to, again, this mystical tradition, this mystical path that nobody has answers for, but it's like, it's always been, and we've never had answers for it, and I guess that's what quantum physics is all about, it's what we're trying to do, we're trying to figure it all out, even though, in my opinion, even that path is not going to be able to figure it out, because right. you're predicating everything on being down here and you have an understanding and you're looking at things analytically and reducing things down of which don't exist in that way like the understanding the maths the science the language the looking at things understanding things analyzing things all comes from a place of implicit separation right and in order to understand that thing well you can't because when you're there you are the one you're just there and how can one thing weigh itself i guess that's the that's the old myth mythic uh creation theory or story it's like in the beginning there was nothing mm -hmm. and nothing was totally bored and that of that boredom nothingness created somethingness to fill itself the nothingness had the something so it was fulfilled and happy no longer bored but the something the one thing only had nothing to weigh itself against so how can that one thing continue to be how can it know that it is if there's only nothing out there just it it doesn't have a hand to look at because that's something other than it mm -hmm. it doesn't have anything else it's just one thing and so that one thing went inside of itself split itself and mirrored and reflected itself it created an illusion of separation so that it could perpetuate itself and continue to exist but and that's it, duality and that's duality it reflects upon itself it goes inwards it goes within but in truth it's still just one thing right. it's still void and then the one thing that was paradoxically created out of nothingness. And then the one thing went inside of itself and it just nuanced all the way down into infinity in this like weird sinking whirlpool tunnel into infinity. But in truth, it's all one process. It, th there's a great metaphor. But if it hadn't done that, it, there would be no quantum physics because it would, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have the capacity to quantify one thing if it was, if, if right. there wasn't that sense of separation. Exactly. You know, like a physicist would say that mm -hmm. the universe is mathematical, but it's also possible that we're just mathematical and we're projecting that mm -hmm. onto nature. Yeah. There's, there's always back and forth weird paradoxical ideas like that, right. which is super funny because we were talking about 
talking about looking back at the past earlier and trying to pull, pull those ideas forward. And we do it all the time. We project humanity all the time onto the re- world around us. And we, we're so arrogant about it. We think we don't do that. But like you, you potentially do. It's like that cliche argument, like, did we discover math or is math something that's a product of humankind? Like, that's a big, big discussion that people have been talking about for and a long time. We should talk about that sometime. We should. But, uh, but yeah, the, the, the metaphor is that a wave or like a whirlpool, since I use the term whirlpool, Think of a whirlpool, right? There are individual particles all in that in that like occurrence, and they're all swirling around a point in the bottom of the whirlpool, right? Or tornado, or whatever you're thinking. But all that's happening is there's one whirlpool. We think of a singular entity called whirlpool, and one ocean. There's like one body of water, but it's made up of all these individual parts and all these individual waves. But when we're thinking of the whirlpool, we don't think oh, like one droplet of water, one droplet of water, one droplet of water, one droplet of water, we're thinking of the holistic entity that's emerging from all of these parts. And it's just it's just a process, which is called whirlpool. And that's like the perennial philosophy. That is the ancient science. That is the, the truth underneath all of it that all of the major world religions are assumed to be pointing at when they give their religious ritual or whatever. So we just went off. Um, we did repeat a couple of things. We went on a few digressions, but ultimately I think we did the idea of the perennial philosophy justice without going too deeply into all of the examples. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. Hopefully the audience listening out there and watching enjoyed it as well. There's so much more to be said, so many caveats, so many examples. The one thing that I wanted to talk about today that we don't really have a whole lot of time for, which we will in the future, is language. Mm-hmm the archetype of language right we were talking about separation understanding looking at things from a human perspective whether or not we could ever interface with the true true reality that the perennial philosophy talks right. about and that has a lot to do in my opinion with my understanding of kabbalah judaic mysticism as well as the Tao, and all of the all of the other traditions we talked about today go hand in hand with this idea of understanding via the language processor that we have in our minds versus just knowing things by direct experience. And we do have an episode on the nature of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, Mm -hmm. which we talk on these points a little bit, but we don't really go super deep into examples from these major religious uh, groups. One that I really want to talk about is Kabbalah and the Hebrew language and their representation of what language meant to them as it represented the real world around them. And everything dealing with that right. so that's i'm excited to talk about that in the near future with you absolutely so that being said thank you guys for watching and listening thank you for tuning in you know where to find us we're on all major streaming platforms and social media platforms as well if you're looking for a specific platform please go to the youtube episode and the link will be in the description for you please let us know what you think about this episode leave a like comment share subscribe All of it helps us. We greatly appreciate you. With that, we'd like to thank you for joining us and continuing the great conversation.